calories in versus calories out, meaning how many calories you ingest versus how many calories you burn is the fundamental and most important formula in this business of fat loss and weight management in general. If you ingest far more calories than you burn, you're likely to gain weight. It's also true that if you ingest fewer calories than you burn, that you will lose weight and that a significant portion of that will come from body fat. Shiver or shivering is a strong stimulus for the release of adrenaline, epinephrine, into fat and the increase in fat oxidation and mobilization. But shiver is not just induced by cold, and there are other subtle forms of movement that can greatly increase fat metabolism and fat loss. There was a group in England during the 1960s and 70s that discovered a pathway by which subtle forms of movement can greatly increase fat loss. What they found were people that overeat but don't gain weight as a consequence. And in fact, many people who had low levels of body fat had a lot of resting tremor, not of the Parkinsonian type, but they would bounce their knee while they were sitting. When they would talk, they would engage in very angular movements. They were sort of electric. People that have a head bob while they're listening, people that nod a lot, people that stand up and sit down a lot throughout the day, and people that pace burn anywhere from 800 to 2,500 calories more than the control group in the experiments that they looked. And people who overeat, the people who can have the, the second or the third donut or donuts at all and don't seem to put on weight to the same degree, they are people that move around a lot even when seated. They are people that will often move their limbs very quickly as well. That There even have been studies that have explored other things that correlate with fidgeters. Fidgeters stand up very quickly at the end of a lecture or they start to gather their things very quickly, whereas non-fidgeters don't. Simply moving a lot, being a fidgeter, bouncing your knee, standing up and pacing several times or many times throughout the day led to considerable amounts of fat loss and weight loss when people were ingesting the same amount of food. If they overate, they were able to compensate and burn off that food. And if they were trying to lose weight and they incorporated this fidgeting protocol of deliberately trying to fidget more and move around during the day, pace, stand up more quickly, sit down more often, sit down and stand up more often rather, they found that they greatly increased their weight loss anywhere from 20 to 30% increases. And in some cases, you know, there are the, always those few people who burned a lot more. It seems to work best in people who are already slightly overweight. So for people that are overweight, who are kind of averse to exercise, fidgeting might actually be a good entry point. Fidgeting movements, staccato movements, standing up, walking around, pacing, are actually mobilizing and oxidizing a lot of fat and a lot of energy. So let's talk about how to use cold as a particularly strong stimulus to increase fat loss. How can you do that? Well, if you get into cold water or an ice bath or a cold day and you try and remain calm and resist shivering, you actually short circuit this mechanism for increasing brown fat thermogenesis. The paper published in Nature shows that it is shivering itself that causes the brown fat to increase your burning, your burn rate and your metabolism. And it works like this. When you get into cold and you shiver, the shivering, those that low level movement of the muscle, those small movements, triggers the release of a molecule called succinate and succinate acts on the brown fat to increase brown fat thermogenesis and fat burning overall. Now, how much cold exposure and how often, that's the key. Are studies that describe positive effects on fat loss of exposing yourself to cold either through cold shower or through ice bath or other cold water, it doesn't have to actually have ice in it provided it's cold enough, for any time between one and five times per week. But it turns out that just one exposure per week can be valuable. The question then is how long to get into that cold environment and how cold should that environment be? It turns out that if you want to trigger the shiver, what you want to do is to get into the cold and then get out of the cold and typically not dry off and then get back into the cold and out of the cold. That will definitely stimulate more shivering than just getting into the cold itself. Just cold enough to be uncomfortable is a good place to start. So for some of you, that's going to be 60 degrees. For some of you, that's going to be 55 degrees. For some of you, it's going to be high 30s, right? Depends on how cold adapted you are and people vary in terms of how well they tolerate the cold. 
meaning do you burn more fat if you do your exercise fasted? And fasted in this respect could be that you wake up in the morning, you've been fasting all night, you just hydrate and you exercise. So probably not having eaten anything for anywhere from three to 24 hours or maybe even more. So here's the rule that, or the protocol that I extracted from that literature. At a period of about 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, there's a switchover point whereby if you ate before the exercise, you will burn far less fat from the 90 minute point onward than you would if you had gone into the training fasted. So let me repeat that. If it's moderate intensity, so-called zone two cardio type exercise, at the 90 minute point, If you happen to have eaten before the exercise within one to three hours prior to the exercise, then you reduce the amount of fat that you will burn from 90 minutes onward. Whereas if you had fasted prior to the exercise, you hadn't eaten anything for three hours or more prior to the exercise, at the 90 minute point, you will, 90 minutes of exercise, you will start to burn more fat than you would had you eaten. Now, there are also studies that point to the fact that you don't have to wait to 90 minutes in order to get this enhanced fat burning effect. The studies I was able to find pointed to the fact that if one does high intensity training, Think about if you were to do something high intensity for 20, 30, 40 minutes, so maybe lift weights and then get into zone two cardio. If you were fasted, the literature says that you're going to burn more body fat per unit time than if you had eaten before or during the exercise. So what does this mean? This means if you want to burn more body fat, exercise intensely for 20 to 60 minutes, the higher the intensity, obviously the shorter that bout is going to be, and then move over into zone two cardio. And if you do that fasted or the medium intensity cardio, I should say, and if you do that fasted, then indeed you will burn a higher percentage of body fat. Now, one thing that's very interesting and cannot be overlooked is this issue of how much energy you burn during and after the activity. And some of you probably already know about this, but the whole business of calories in versus calories out and people counting their the number of calories they burn during their aerobic session or during their whatever session is only one half of the equation. And it really eclipses the more important issue, which is how much of an increase in metabolism does a given exercise create after the exercise? The simple way to view this is that high intensity training, anaerobic training of weight training, sprints, um, burpees, any kind of thing, push-ups, sit-ups, whatever it happens to be, that anaerobic exercise that's of higher intensity or sprints taps into glycogen stores during the movement and will burn more energy per unit time than moderate intensity. High intensity burns more than moderate intensity. That's straightforward. What's interesting is that all the studies that I was able to find on what happens after that type of exercise show that the percentage of fat that you burn after high intensity exercise is actually greater. In other words, you burn a lot of glycogen during the high intensity exercise and then after the exercise, the post-exercise oxygen consumption as it's sometimes called, goes up. We know this after you train intensely, that post-exercise oxygen consumption goes up sometimes for up to 24 hours. And it is during that period of time that you oxidize more fat. It does seem that the high intensity exercise followed by moderate intensity exercise is going to be optimal for fat burning overall. Because when you look at the percentage of body fat burned and you look at the overall increase in basal metabolic rate, moderate and high intensity training followed by low intensity training or even just followed by going back into life is going to be the best way to continue to burn body fat because of the ways that it increases basal metabolic rate.